So a lot more than, than we know about. Uh, some successful, some unsuccessful, some just a little successful, you know what I mean. But yeah, I'm gonna talk about that, yeah. Yeah, um, because as you said at the beginning, I think the military has red angles or other people. Yeah. But they understand some of the problems. So for example, Vietnam was a potential revolutionary moment when all these soldiers were disobeying orders. But what it was really was an insurrectionary moment that didn't lead to any revolution, any real change in consciousness, except maybe a certain percentage of soldiers who came home and said, Vietnam veterans against the war. And because I think the military understands all this, they got rid of the draft. And to piggyback on what Richard said is, one of the major changes is they realize that the biggest single deterrent to their strategy is to have body bags in mass coming home. So technology has allowed the killing of many people using less soldiers than in the past. So in a way, the army has figured out that we don't have to really worry about insurrection in the military because we're limiting the numbers who really go to fight. Or we, or because the danger is if we send too many and they die, we have, a, we have a real problem. So there's always an acceptable loss category uh, amount that doesn't really create problems from their perspective. So I think technology has enabled them to circumvent that whole issue of any revolutionary potential that might exist within the military by simply making it themselves less dependent on bodies, human bodies, to perform the tasks. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm 292% convinced that one reason why the draft ended was because the military saw this as something negative, negatively affecting them. Right. right? They didn't want it, you know. I mean, uh, they could always say, well, look at all the draft resistance. The American public doesn't want it, you know, but really, was they that don't want it. And the, and the same way in the ruling class in general, you'll, you'll find a, a consensus against the draft. I mean, the draft would be hard to introduce today, especially a uh, universal draft. Right. You know, I, I agree, you know, um, but it's one has to get around that in the current situation. Well, it's ironic too that they understood that within their context, I wouldn't use the word revolutionary like this, but within their right. context, it was the middle class that represented a much more, a larger revolutionary threat because the working class goes in because it's poor, it needs some of the benefits. Some go in because they have that nationalist belief, but most, it's, a, it's an economic necessity. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, until you're killed or wounded, you have some obligation to your employer. But the middle class created problems when whole swaths of students on campuses like Harvard, the Ivy League, refused to go, just outright. And, and, and the college I went to, nobody went who didn't want to go. Yep. And in the meantime, made lots of noise about why you shouldn't go. So that represented a threat. Yeah, to right. Too. I and didn't really call it revolutionary, but they saw the middle class. On the other, so, on the other hand, those insurrectionary forces mm -hmm. within the military that were in the uh, GI anti-war movement. I'm, I'm not just including those that were veterans, but those that were actually in the military doing something against the military or against the war. They were predominantly working class. Well, they you know? also got drafted. Maybe. Yes. They also got drafted. Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't mean to say that they were impossible to create it, but they yeah. saw this threat outside that. No, okay. We still have three people who did not have a chance to have their questions. So in honor of your talk, I, I wrote a short little campfire song. I'm going to lay down my sword and shield, but not for very long. Soon I will rise up strong, smite those who do me wrong. I'm going to study war some more. Sun Tzu and Guy Debord, I'm going to study war some more. So it can actually be like 99 bottles of beer in the wall. You can have <laughs> Gita boards not only in there for the rhyme, but 
Machiavellian Gita board, Frederick Engels and Gita board. It's, it's endless, and in fact, we could have an all day uh, Engels Military Institute seminar. For instance, I would like to talk about uh, the Daruti columns in the Spanish Civil War, and did Daruti really waste gas trying to blow up every Catholic church in, in Spain? Tactical questions like that. Um, I would mention that the Israeli Defense Force has been studying the thought of the anarcho-Marxist Jules Deleuze. Um, I mean, there's just endless uh, theor theoreticians and practitioners of revolutionary uh, warfare. That I, what's, I mentioned Guy Debord. He, he developed a board game called Kriegspiel. And, uh, War play. From after Clausewitz, basically, and supply lines are incredibly important in this board game if you're going to win the war. So, thanks for your presentation. Okay. Thanks for your poll. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, two more. Um, two more. Yeah, I, I had an experience when I was 20, I, I joined the uh, reserves, the Army Reserves, and uh, um, I, I, my unit was called up in the Berlin crisis, and they were they were called to Fort Gordon, Georgia. When I arrived, I was one of the younger military people in, the, in our unit. They were, they were mostly around 23, 25, a lot of them. Uh, they had already served their basic training, and then they were, in, they were just in the unit. They had to stay in the unit and go to meetings and stuff. Anyway, they got called away from their families and jobs for this call up. And when I got there, um, they were in the process of, of, of conducting hunger strikes, letter campaigns. There were over 200 people from New York City area. They had no fear of uh, <coughs> authority, generals or whatever. And, <coughs> and here I was, I was more naive, 20, but I joined them because of their, I really was taken by them. And uh, <coughs> there's a whole reason to read over there and it was a whole history of resistance for several months but it, it, it culminated and we had a parade we had a march on a saturday morning it was a, all the regular army troops marched in front of the general up on the stand and his family and when we, we, we were last about over 200 of us and, and it was, i mean it was a great example of power and numbers <coughs> we marched up in the, the major i think that I was right in front of the general as we passed. And so we sang this song of resistance to somebody, I, I'm a, friend, a friend of mine actually wrote, it was, what the hell are we doing here, why me? And then two, over 200 of us gave the general the finger. And this was a terrible example, you know, for all the regular army troops. And so here we've been fighting to leave because it was, we had nothing to do. They finally let us go two weeks later. They kicked us all out. So it was a good example. But a one quick question is that um, if, if you believe in the right to bear arms and uh, the Second Amendment, and you also, uh, when I think of, oh, excuse me, when I think of militias, I think of, you know, uh, uh, white supremacists and neo-Nazis and they're being armed. I don't, I don't know too many leftists that are armed. According to Engels, should I be armed? Yes. Uh, there are leftist groups that are armed. Uh, was John Brown? What's the name of the group? John Brown? Uh, I forget what the, the full name is. The uh, if you want to consider them leftists, the Liberal Gun Club in Oakland, uh, the um, Red Rifles, the Pink Pistols. Really? All leftist groups. Uh, I I was raised in arms. I hate to say that, you know. Um, your I, mother, your mother, I, I don't hate to say that, but I mean, I was. My is father. That, is that your mother's arms? Well, that's what that's what why I would hate to say it. You might confuse it. But my my father was uh, very heavy into guns. He went hunting a lot. Uh, uh, target practice. There were always at least three or four guns in my house. I learned I learned how to shoot by the time I was 12. Uh, shoot how to rifle, you know. He gave me a rifle by the time I was 15, you know. I used to go hunting and all that, you know. I just I even have a weapon now. But I mean, I disregard that 
as I don't think about it. I'm not a gun nut, or I'm not phobic against guns. You know, I just think guns are guns. It depends on how you use them. Um, the uh, second thing I would say is that next week uh, or next time I'll go into some of the things that you like you talked about when uh, during the uh, Vietnam War. Yeah, let me just let me say something else. I was socialized very much from the time I was about 10 years old, actually about 8 years old, 7 years old, looking back at little pictures that I found of myself when I was uh, 7, 8 years old. Very much socialized in the military. By the time I was 10, I knew I wanted to join the Marines. By the time I was 17, I was in the Marines. Uh, Vietnam War came along, I was against the war, okay, and I, that was quite a big change. But uh, I also did work with, uh, my major work against the war during that time was with soldiers and sailors who were involved in anti-war activities. I've read almost all the, the literature of that period, and in reference to what you said, uh, when I talked with a lot of soldiers and sailors that I worked with, I found out events that occurred that were not even written in the thickest volumes of the anti-war GI movement in, in the Vietnam era. You know? Many more occurred than have ever been discussed. And a lot of them have been discussed. You know? you know, it's a lot we don't know. Okay, we have one last question, which is me. Um, and we just uh, put this back here. The meeting that you're talking about is meeting upstairs, so there's not that much pressure. We, uh, if, I can, if I can, I'll just stop okay. there. Um, yeah, you mentioned at the beginning your talks in China, and I was disappointed that you didn't talk more about China in terms of uh, how Engels' work is being applied in China at the present day. Because I know that uh, there is a rich history there. I know that China has its own military institutes and they are bringing um, military people from other countries in to study with them. And I know also that Xi Jinping is head of the People's Liberation Army. So uh, I think there's a rich field there of uh, ideas and so forth. And I'm kind of interested in your assessment of how these ideas are being applied in China and uh, the preparedness for that China has towards uh, future U U.S. aggression. Okay. You know, about, uh, and you were present, I think, at this meeting. Was you, there were several persons from the uh, Chinese consulate in mm -hmm. San Francisco, plus a few others that were here. And I don't remember the date, but it was sometime maybe 2013, 14, 15, somewhere, where I did discuss the PLA. Uh, but I would be glad, I, it does need some updates, and so I would be glad to uh, discuss that in, in the future, and I'm glad that you, you know, brought that up. But it was just, what was the you know, I, I, I couldn't the speak about everything this time. You know what I mean? I couldn't no, apply it to all the cases. Right, but in view of uh, the importance of this in terms of, uh, you know, what the U.S. is doing. I mean, both China and Russia support the duly elected president of Venezuela, for example. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'm just saying, I would like, and maybe we can schedule for another talk specifically on China. And the military. Yeah, I could go into that a, a yeah. lot more, but yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so I'd be very interested in your thoughts. Okay. We have two minutes left. Good. Idea, for those who didn't know about this, uh, the highlight of my quote, military, uh, or socialist military career was in 2014 when I was invited to the uh, Chinese Academy of Military Science. You know, and some of you were here when I gave the report back on it. And uh, uh, I said that that was one of the greatest 
experiences in my life to go there and speak, uh, which I talked about the uh, decline and demise of the Soviet army from the late 70s to 1991, and with a lot of implications for China. But, yeah. So, uh, Mr. Chair, yeah. about uh, two or three months ago, I said something Maybe it's on the sun. I forget. And you said something about what are you? The question is, what's scientific socialism or something like that? Which I a lot of times like to prefer over Marxism because, you know, Marx is a person, very important. Anyway, and so what I'd like to say today, thank you, Al, is uh, for me this is one good example of all the Sunday mornings we've done for a year or two of what I would call a some research scientific research, thorough, relatively, in relative terms, read more than Eng of Engels than anybody I know, uh, and then presented, presented his arguments in a way, and I think one of the problems we, uh, anybody has in a good presentation, is almost every sentence, or maybe say every paragraph, has something in there that you could unpack and turn into a whole other half an hour, hour presentation. And he's done that 20 or 30 times. And he keeps saying, I either wrote about that five, six, or seven lectures ago, or I'm happy to do it in a couple of months. So I'm just saying, I, what I'm saying, thank you, I'm saying, when you read Marx, uh, say you read Kaplan, whatever, or Engels, or whoever, so a, a proper historical materialist, dialectical materialist type, you're reading what we're talking about, the science of doing this. And I feel like Al comes about as close as you can get to we ever get that. And I really appreciate it because it's a training. It's, we, it's raising the bar. You know, we're raising the bar to where if we really want to have a revolution, if we really want to dump these guys that have all this money, experience, blah, 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 and the bourgeoisie, his military, and everything else, we have to be ultimately, we, Thousands, if not millions, of us have to be better at this shit than they are. We, need to yeah. Yeah. we have to be better than they are. The standards are very high. Go for it. <laughs> Good luck. I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, to it a, happens. Uh, yeah, to a, a, a big uh, army that will build. Uh, I trust the working class to build whatever it needs. Oh, I don't actually. Yeah. 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 All right. Actually, I didn't know.